Haven't you finished packing yet? Not yet, sir, but I'm getting along. Well, be as quick as you can, won't you? Indeed, I will. But these things do take a bit of collecting. Well, how about his chemical apparatus? He's very particular about that, you know. He will have packed that himself by now. Really, Holmes, this is too bad. You realize that my wife and the rest of the furniture will be here at any moment. I told you the van that's bringing my stuff is taking all your things into the country. I'm so sorry, my dear Watson. I was somewhat engrossed in my correspondence. I had no idea that my retirement would cause such a stir. You know, all sorts of people have written. Here's an interesting communication, for instance. Oh, what's that? It's a telegram of good wishes from our old friend Abernethy, the forger. Oh, yes. We got him uh, ten years, didn't we? Uh, yes, yes, uh, we did, yes. Uh, when he came out, I was able to render him some slight assistance. You know, I'm not sure, my dear Watson, that of all the kindly messages I've received, even from the most exalted person, that this is not the most gratifying. Well, I don't suppose they're all regrets at your retirement. <laughs> I imagine there are quite a number of people who'll be immensely relieved. Undoubtedly, my dear Watson. Chief among them, another old friend, Professor Moriarty. <laughs> oh, Moriarty. Do you know, Holmes, he's the one subject on which I believe you're utterly mistaken. Oh, no mistake, my dear Watson. That harmless old professor of mathematics. Mm. That harmless old professor of mathematics, as you call him, is the brain behind the biggest criminal organization in Europe. You know, my one regret in retiring is that the police neglected to take advantage of the opportunity I gave them of arresting it. I failed to run into earth. Well, we won't argue about it, Holmes. Well, I'd better run along and see if the band's left my place here. Mr. Holmes, there's a gentleman outside wants to see you in particular. Oh? What's the gentleman like? Well, he's an old gentleman and very tall. Ask him to come up. Yes, sir. Huh. Another well-wisher. Come in, my dear professor. May I point out, Mr. Holmes, that it is a very dangerous habit to ping a loaded revolver in the pocket of one's dressing gown? Just a slight precaution, professor. As a matter of fact, I half expected a visit from you to satisfy yourself personally that I really was going. Your perception, as usual, does you credit, Mr. Holmes. I must confess that, personally speaking, I cannot regret your intention to retire. I can well believe you, Professor. I also feel that from your own point of view, it is a very wise course. In fact, it is the only course possible. I'm afraid I don't quite follow. Do you not, Mr. Holmes? Allow me to refresh your memory. Listen, Mr. Holmes. On the 4th of January last, you crossed my path. On the 23rd, you incommoded me. By the middle of February, I was very much inconvenienced by you. And at the end of March, I was seriously hampered in my plans. The situation, in fact, had become an impossible one. Oh, that was my intention. Mr. Holmes, it has been an intellectual treat with you. And I say unaffectedly, it would have been a great grief to me to have been forced to take any extreme measures. Danger happens to be part of my trade, Professor. Danger? It isn't a question of danger, but of inevitable destruction. Therefore, I say again, you are wise to retire. When you want to get to the country, take my advice and stay there. And suppose I should reconsider my decision. You have my warning. I wish you a pleasant and permanent retirement. Now see here. 
Colonel Moran. How much longer have I got to wait? Where is this Mr. Moriarty? He's received your message, and he'll see you as soon as it's convenient for him. He's waiting here for three quarters of an hour. Who the devil does he think he is? If I may give you a word of advice, Mr. Balding, I should moderate your tone a little when you meet the professor. Is that so? Hey, you! Wait a minute! What devil tricks this? No devil tricks. I only wanted to prevent your going before I had spoken to you. And who gave you the right to turn a key at me, huh? We didn't discuss that matter. I understand you have a proposition to make to me. Maybe I have. And maybe I've changed my mind. Why you cut me wait? I speak to people when I choose, Mr. Holden. Not to me, you don't. Unlock that door. Sit down. I cut open that door. Sit down. You're merely wasting time. You traveled here on a false passport. And the American police would be interested to know your whereabouts. So you will do as you're told. Okay, Mr. Moriarty. I understand you represent an American society which is anxious to remove one of its ex-members who is now living in this country under an assumed name. That is so. And you wish the aid of my organization. What do you propose to pay? $50,000. Reasonable. Now you will tell me all you know about this man, how you traced him to England, when he arrived here, and in what part of the country he was last heard of. Colonel Moran speaking. Yes, he's interviewing the professor now. Yes, we're quite satisfied with his credentials. It's simply a question of whether the professor decides to take up the case or not. I will take up the case, Mr. Balding, on one condition. Yes? Yeah. That you place yourself entirely in my hands. Carry out my instructions implicitly and obey my slightest order without question. Very well. Good. You will now return to your hotel. You will make no move whatever until you hear from me. When's that likely to be? It may be a week. It may be a month. Rest assured you will hear from me. When I am ready, your orders will be delivered by hand. You understand? Yeah, I get you. Very well. You will now find the door open. Good day. Okay. I'm relying on you, Professor. Oh, by the way, don't forget... Going downstairs again, darling? Yeah, for a little. I don't think I'm going to sleep. You've been dreadfully nervy all day, dear. Was anything wrong? No, dear, nothing. I just don't feel I'm going to sleep, that's all. Sorry, Mrs. Hudson. <laughs> oh, 
Is Mrs. Watson coming down with the doctor? Uh, no. No, she isn't. I, I gather that she's too busy in Baker Street. Oh, so it can only be the doctor. Yes. <laughs> is it or just the doctor? Oh, oh. oh here he is. Good morning, Holmes. Oh, my dear Watson. I'm delighted to see you. Good morning, Mrs. Hudson. Good morning, Doctor. Well, how are you? Oh, I'm much better, thank you, Watson. You're looking better. I hope Mrs. Hudson's seeing that you have proper meals. Oh, I'm living like a fighting cock. Uh, we had a delicious chicken casserole yesterday. Didn't we? Yes. And you let it all get cold while you were deducing the age of the chicken. <laughs> <laughs> As a matter of fact, what this is a tough proposition. I bit off more than I could chew. <laughs> well, go along inside, Watson, and have a drink. I know you must need one after your long journey. Yes, I could do with one, thanks. Oh, this is very nice, Holmes. No, I hope it's so, Watson. Thanks. It's so pure acid. You're developing a curious sense of humor. What? So I do. Uh, well, you settled in comfortably in Baker Street. As far as I can see, we are. But Mrs. Watson doesn't seem to think so. No. No, you've been uh, you've been moving things about a bit. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you moved your shaving mirror over to the fireplace. Yes, that's right. My wife has a dressing table where we used to have. How do you know? Well, dear Watson, you're a man of precise habits and considerable regard for your personal appearance. Is I observed that whilst the right hand side of your face is closely shaved, and the further we get to the left, and the more careless your shaving appears. So we come to the angle of the jaw where it is positively sudden. See, I, I deduce, therefore, that you placed your shaving mirror where the light strikes on the right side of the face. The bed must obviously be across the end of the room, therefore the fireplace is the only place left which could produce that result. Amazing, though. Elementary, my dear Watson. Elementary. Oh, by the way, I've got a letter for you. Oh, I would like to remark. <clears throat> Hello. This is interesting. No. This is a letter from Paulot. Well, who's Paulot? Well, it's rather difficult to say. It's a gentleman of many aliases. He wouldn't be of any importance except for the fact that he's one of Moriarty's creatures. Oh, I see, Moriarty. A link in the chain. It's a good way down the chain. Not a very good link. Now, look here, Holmes. Please remember that you've retired. Twice he sent me advance information that has enabled me to prevent a crime. Whether it was his conscience that made him do it, or a ten-pound note sent to him by devious methods, I've never discovered. What do you make of that, Watson? I don't want to make anything of it. Put it in the waste paper basket. Don't it My dear Watson, I'm willing to put anything in the waste paper basket if I can do so with a clear conscience. I might never forgive myself if I did so in this case. What do you mean? I mean that something sinister is afoot, Watson. Just cast your eye over there. Obviously in cipher. Oh, how true, Watson. How true. I'm glad you spotted it. Yes, there's only one word, Burst. And then there's a series of numbers that obviously represent other words. The problem is taken from some book. Now, the point is, what book? Well, why doesn't the fool tell you? Well, my dear Watson, send the key of the cipher in the same envelope as the cipher itself. Oh, no, my dear fellow, the key will probably follow in another envelope. And meanwhile, it might be instructive if we try to decipher this ourselves. Now, the cipher message begins with the number 534. Mm -hmm. Well, that's probably page 534. We've got a large book. The next line is C2. What do you make of that, Watson? Oh, chapter 2, of course. <laughs> Well, hardly that, Mr. Watson. What size book would it be if chapter 2 were on page 534? Oh. Well, column, then. <laughs> Brilliant, Watson. Brilliant. Brilliant. You're scintillating this morning. Now, we've got a large book printed in double columns. Any other suggestions? For the Bible? My dear Watson, you, you sell yourself. As I remark just now, Porlock is one of Moriarty's men, and I can hardly imagine any less likely book in his possession than the Bible. No, the Bible has too many editions. No. No, this must be a standardized book, and page 534 will be the same in all copies. Uh, try again, Watson. I have a Bradshaw. 
Well, that's a good idea, Watson, but uh, if I may say so, it's not quite good enough. I know, Whitaker's Almanac. Now, come along, and let's see what page 534 has in store for us. Just write this down. Danger? Good, Watson, good. Got that down? Yes, yeah, capital. Owner? Burston? Castle. Well, what does it mean? It means, Watson, that some devilry is brewing against the owner of Burston Castle. Jesus, Mr. Holmes, is Inspector Lestrade. Oh, hello, morning, gentlemen. Morning, morning. morning, Lestrade. I told him he wasn't to come running, Mr. Holmes. But he said he was very sweet if I didn't let him in. That's all right, Mrs. Hudson. That's all right. You understand, Inspector, that Mr. Holmes is retired. You're not going to drag him up to London. Oh, no, sir. I wasn't thinking of doing that. I called him to ask Mr. Holmes if he'd be good enough. Burlston? Well, what's this, Mr. Holmes? This is magic. That's a cipher that Watson has just solved. Well, what's the matter, Inspector? The matter? Only that Mr. Douglas of Burlstone Castle was horribly murdered last night. What? Shot. Face completely blown away. So Porlock's message came too late. Porlock? Who's Porlock? And how can he prophesy murder? Campbell will postmark. Well, that doesn't tell us much. It tells you as much as you'll ever know, Inspector. I used to send him money to the Campbellville Post Office. But didn't you find out who called for him? No. No, I promised not to try and chase him. Yeah, I gather he was of a rather shy, no, not to say retiring disposition. Well, we can't waste any more time. Will you come over to Burlstone with Mr. Holmes? On the way, I'll tell you all I know. No, we're not going far, then. About uh, 20 miles. You'll be back for lunch. I forbid it. I'd sooner go myself than let you go. Excitement's bad for you. I appeal to you, Inspector. He really ought not to go. My right, dear Watson, I appreciate your thought of it. I wouldn't dream of going if I were not convinced that Moriarty is behind all this. Not your Professor Moriarty? Yes, let's say Professor Moriarty. My dear Mr. Holmes, you're beginning to see his hand in everything. Morlock is one of Moriarty's men. Boris here, let's say, I'll bet you my new beehive to your old bowler hat that you'll find that Moriarty is behind this boat. All right, I'll take you. Good. This will take well back into the past, Watson. I suggest you the remains of the old uh, outer fortifications. Yes, obviously. Well, I suggest, Mr. Holmes, that we should do better to go inside and view the scene of the tragedy. Well, my dear Lestrade, I always think it wise to get one's bearings before proceeding into uh, deeper water. My dear Watson, what kind of a tree is it that comes to maturity and blossoms in water? No, 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 no. This water is a recent addition. Hmm. Makes it much more difficult to get out of the window. Yes, yes, Watson. Or to get in. Possibly Mr. Douglas anticipated this crime. Ah, Inspector Griffith. Uh, this is Mr. Sherlock Holmes. How do you do, sir? How do you do? <clears throat> oh, this is my friend, Dr. Watson. How do you do? How do you do? Uh, well, shall we get in? By all means, Inspector. This is what it was done with, Mr. Holmes. I found it lying just there. There was no signs of a struggle except the peculiar position of that chair. Now tell me, who else besides Mr. Douglas was in the house at the time of the tragedy? Uh, Mrs. Douglas and Mr. Cecil Barker, a friend of the family. Here you are, Mr. Holmes. Dear me, these are dreadful injuries. Must have been at point blank range. Whoever did this didn't intend to miss. Well, one could hardly miss with a sawn off shotgun. They're American, Pennsylvania Small Arms Company. You'll observe that the triggers are wired together. So we've got both barrels at once. And what do you make of this card, Mr. Holmes? ZZ341. It's found pinned to the body. Rough cardboard. It's yeah, not written in this room. If this was done with a broad nib, these are fine. What does it mean, Holmes? You say the drawbridge is raised every evening? Yes, about sunset. And the tragedy occurred about half past eleven. Yes. Obviously, suicide. We thought that at first, sir. Huh? You've observed, of course, that someone has been hiding here. Hmm? <coughs> the distinct marks of muddy boots. Uh, when were these curtains drawn? At dusk. Hmm. So the man must have got in after the curtains were drawn and before the bridge was raised. 
Yes, but I observe when I arrive that the moat doesn't extend right round the castle. Well, the ruined tower at the end of the building is accessible without crossing the drawbridge. Yes, but the only way from the tower to this part of the house is through this solid oak door, which is always kept locked. Is it? Why, Joe Holmes, he doesn't seem to be locked now. Does it? Well, that's funny. I always understood. Yes, we'll return to that later. And meanwhile, I must ask you to make no reference whatever to it. Now I think we'll have another look at the body. Oh, and I should like to have a word with that Mr. Cecil Barker. Very good, sir. Mr. What do you make of this curious mark on Douglas's forearm, Holmes? Do you think it's a sign of some secret society? How would you say that was done, Watson? It isn't a towing. No, it's a brand. It's been done with a red hot iron. Very painful. Mr. Parker, this is Mr. Sherlock Holmes. How do you do? I'm very glad you were able to come, Mr. Ham. <clears throat> oh, uh, this is my friend, Dr. Watson. How do you do? How do you do? Now, Mr. Barker, I understand you discovered the body. Yes, I heard the shot and came straight down. Poor Douglas is lying where you see him now. Light a candle was on the table. Mm. This candle? Yes. And you gave the alarm immediately? Yes, I rang the bell for Ames. That's the butler. And a minute later, he came in. So that within two minutes of the murder, Ames was in this room? Yes. What was the first thing he did? He put that lamp he was carrying on the table. It uh, blew out the candle. As a matter of fact, I was here so quickly myself after the shot. But I must actually have been in the room while the murderer was escaping through the window. Why do you say through the window? Because there's no other way out. That door to the tower is always locked. But we just... Now, discussed... tell me, Mr. Barker, did Mrs. Douglas come in here after the tragedy? No, I was able to stop her just in time. How long have you known Mr. and Mrs. Douglas? About a year. I met them when they first came to Switzerland. Oh. How long have they been here? About uh, nine months. Hmm. You don't know anything about uh, Douglas's past life. He used to live in Chicago. You never heard him speak of any secret society. Funny you should mention that. He never told me about it himself, but I always got the impression that he, he was a member of one or an ex-member. You don't know what that mark on his arm was? No. I've seen it often, of course, but he never told me what it was. I never liked to ask him. It was one of the things that rather made me wonder about that secret society. Anything odd about his behavior at any time? Well, he hated meeting people. In Switzerland, he hardly ever moved from his chalet in the mountains. That made me wonder if somebody was after him. When he suddenly packed both into England, it made me wonder all the more. Come in. Excuse me, sir, but Mrs. Douglas would like to see Mr. Holmes when he's finished his investigation in this room. Oh, certainly. Uh, Mr. Barker, would you be good enough to tell Mrs. Douglas that I'll be with her in a minute? Oh, Anne? Yes, sir. If you're here, you may as well answer a few questions. Very good, sir. Now, regarding the tragedy, did you hear the report of the gun? No, sir. You know what these old houses are. Walls are a mile thick. Now, Ames. Yes, sir. When you entered the room, this candle was a light, I understand. Yes, sir. Where would Mr. Douglas have got it from? His bedroom, sir. Well, I had orders to see that one was always on his bedside table. And you put this one there yourself? Yes, sir. I remember he told me his old one had burned right down, so I put in a new one. Oh, it is a new one? Yes, sir. It hasn't been relit since the tragedy? No, sir. I'll vouch for that, sir. Ah. Did these candles come out of the same box as that one on the table? Yes, sir. Yes. Yes, thank you. Uh, have there been any strangers about the place lately? No, sir. Oh, wait a minute. An old gentleman did call a little while back to look over the ruin part. But we often have people come to see that. It dates from the Norman Conquest. That's right. Right. Well, there's nothing more that you can tell me, eh? No, sir. I can't make head or tail of the whole <laughs> thing. Fairly beats me. And the wedding ring being missing, too. Wedding ring? Didn't Mr. Barker tell you? Not a word. What about the wedding ring? The master always wore a plain gold wedding ring under the one with the rough gold nugget on it. Under? Yes, sir. 
I never saw him without it. And for the murderer to take that and leave the other seems so strange, doesn't it? Here. Here. Here was just one more question, eh? Did your master ever do exercises in the morning? Yes, sir. Every morning. Hmm. As regularly as clockwork. I see. Thank you. Thank you. Will that be all, sir? Yes, thank you. Well, Mr. Holmes, the most important point so far is that obviously this has something to do with the secret society. On the contrary, my dear Lestrade, I suggest that the most important point so far is that Mr. Douglas did exercises every morning. You can't be serious, Mr. Holmes. Mark you, I don't mind you asking all these questions about exercises and candles, but I can't see how they help to clear up what we're investigating. I show Mrs. Douglas and Mr. Holmes will see her. Thank you. Now, I'd like to ask you one or two questions, if you don't mind. Yes, sir. Did you know Mrs. Douglas before her marriage? No. But you've seen a good deal of her since. What are you suggesting? You've seen a good deal of him. I'm not suggesting anything. I'm here to get back. Did Mr. Douglas entirely approve of your friendship with his wife? I refuse to answer. I suppose you realize that your refusal indicates that you've something to hide? I've got nothing to hide. I can't help what it indicates to you. Now, look here, sir. It won't do any good to adopt that attitude. All right, I'm sorry. I know you're only doing your duty. As a matter of fact, I may as well tell you. Poor Douglas did have one fault, and that was jealousy. He liked my being here, but if that's that Mrs. Douglas and I had too much to say to each other, he used to go off the deep end and say the wildest things. But I assure you that no man ever had a more faithful wife than Eddie or a more loyal friend than I. No doubt. Still, the fact that his wedding ring is missing rather suggests that the marriage and the tragedy were in some way connected? I have no idea what it suggests. If you're insinuating there's anything between me and Mrs. Douglas, you're on the wrong track, that's all. I don't think I have anything more to say to you. Any more questions, Mr. Holmes? No, not at the moment. Let's see it now. It immensely adds to the zest of an investigation when one is in conscious sympathy with the historical atmosphere of one's surroundings. May I commend this little book to your attention? History of Burleson? Huh. I've got something better to do than to read that sort of stuff. Right. Well, that's a pity, Lisbeth. That's a pity, because you see here that this castle was erected in the fifth year of the reign of James I. And there are various associations of interest connected with this ancient building. I don't doubt it, but that's got nothing to do with us. Breadth of view, my dear Lisbeth, is one of the essentials of our profession. Yes, well, as you don't seem to agree with this, perhaps we'd better go and see Mrs. Douglas. Ah, that's better. Now, show you the way. You can remove the body. Very good, sir. That's it. You've met Inspector Lestrade. This is Mr. Sherlock Holmes. How do you do, Mr. Holmes? How do you do? <clears throat> well, may I present my friend, Dr. Watson? How do you do? It was good of you to come, Mr. Holmes. Not at all. I hope I may be of service to you. Won't you make yourself comfortable? Well, I think I shall leave you now. If you want me, I shall be in the garden. Now, Mrs. Douglas, I wonder if you can give us any help. I wish I could, but I didn't see the tragedy. Yeah, so I understand, but you heard the shot. Now, how long after that were you stopped on the stairs by Mr. Barker? A couple of minutes. I just had to put on a wrap and some slippers. Hmm. How long had your husband been downstairs before you heard the shot? Two or three minutes. Not more than five. Where were you married, Mrs. Douglas? In New York. Ah, in America? Have you ever suspected there was some danger threatening your husband and that he knew it? Yes, I have. In fact, I'm sure of it. But he wouldn't talk about it. Not that there wasn't complete love and understanding between us, but, well, it's just that he didn't want me to be worried. You know nothing of his life in America that could have caused that threatening danger? Nothing at all. That mark on his arm, do you know what that is? No. You never asked him? Yes, I did once, but he refused to discuss it. 
So I never asked again. You have no idea what it is? None whatsoever. Can you suggest anything? Mrs. Douglas, I suggest that you tell me the truth. Mr. Holmes! You know perfectly well what that mark is. You couldn't possibly have lived in America without knowing. That mark is the brand of the Scourers. Scourers? Yes, an American secret society which terrorized the coal districts of Vermeer, and which was broken up some years ago. Well, I'm bound to admit, Holmes, I've never heard of them. Oh, I can well believe that, Watson, but I can't believe that Mrs. Douglas has never heard of the Scourers, because her husband was one. All right, Mr. Holmes, I'll tell you the truth. I think that will be the wisest course. I'll tell you the story of the Missile Valley, the Valley of Fear. Two years ago, I lived at the Missile with my father. He used to take in boarders occasionally. And one evening, I went down to the depot to collect a package. And I met a young man who'd just come off the train. His name was Murdoch, and he was looking for lodging. The minute I set eyes on him, I knew he was the one man in the world for me. I told him about our place, and he said he'd call later. That evening, while I was clearing away supper, I heard a knock at the door. Mr. I sure have. I try to make it a habit to keep my word. Who's that, Eddie? I want to see you about a room, Dad. Eddie, saw that image. Mine's Jack. This is Mr. Murdoch. He wants to board with us. Well, yeah, shoot me fine. Well, take your things off. Thanks. I dare say we can fix it. Twenty dollars a month for the term. That's all right for me. I better give you my first month. Okay. We've come into the sitting room. Well, this looks pretty good to me. Why don't you sit down? You know, I don't think I'm going to feel homesick. Are we trying to make you comfortable? Don't you worry, Eddie. This is going to be more like home than any place I've been in since I've come to the States. Oh, you're not American, then? No, as a matter of fact, I was born in England, but uh, I've been here the best part of my life. Border. I suppose you figure you got things fixed up pretty good here, eh? Yeah, that's the idea. Any objection? No. Come here. Come on, get a move on. But I've been a boarder myself, so I'll put you wise. Eddie belongs to me. She's sweet on me. Get me? Well, there's no accounting for taste. But you're one of these fresh guys, eh? Well, don't get fresh with me, that's all. Ted, please. Jack didn't mean anything. Oh, Jack, is it? It's come to that already, eh? I think if you were to leave us alone, Eddie, we might get that thing straightened out. Listen, I know how to get this thing straightened out. You know what that means? No, and I don't care. Well, you can take it from me, and you will. I'll be here tomorrow night, and I'll expect to find you gone. Well, I wouldn't bet on that if I were you. You'll be sorry you ever came here before I'm through with you. Why, you're not going, Ted? Say, Eddie, what's the matter with Ted? Oh, he sore of Mr. Murdoch being our new boarder. Sorry, you should have a scare on your first night, Mr. Murdoch. Scare? Yeah. You don't think I'm scared of that, do you? Most people are. Well, I'm not. 
Who the devil is he, anyway? He's one of the bosses of the Scourers. The what? The Scourers. A society of murderers and blackmailers. The ancient order of freemen, they call themselves. No, baloney. The freemen are to be found in every town in the state. It's a society for charity and good fellowship. Not here, it ain't. It's just a murder gang. Well, then why don't they bring them to justice? Tell me that. Because no one dares give evidence against them. Juries don't dare to convict. The judge has to do as he's told, and the police are all square. Say, you're just trying to kid me. I don't believe a word of it. Aren't there 50 murders to prove it? Is there a man or woman in the valley who doesn't believe it? Well, you don't scare me. You see, you don't know me, and you don't know McGinty and his gang. McGinty, eh? <laughs> That's queer. I've got a date with that guy this evening. McGinty? What do you got to do with McGinty? Well, I've got a report to him. You see, I happen to be a freeman myself. What? What? You a freeman? Then you don't stay here another minute. Here. Here's your $20 back. I wouldn't have you for a hundred a week. But you can't sell them out now. Oh, can't I? I'm telling you, I got no use for these freemen. It's bad enough to have one hang around Eddie. I'm not going to have another for a border. You get out of here tonight. Well, tomorrow morning. I'm sorry. That's all right. But don't make any mistake. I'll be seeing a lot of you. It's no good. With Ted Balding. Tell me, Eddie. You're not in love with Balding, are you? You're only afraid of him. If you'd have met me first, would I have had a chance? I wish you had been the first. That's all I wanted to know. Oh, Jack, I'll never believe anything bad of you. Not whatever happens. Well, I wouldn't be too sure of that, Eddie. Still, even a guy like me can be on the level with a woman. Well, I'll begin down to begin here. Whiskey. Well, stranger, I don't seem to call your face to mind. No, I'm new here, McGinty. Counselor McGinty, to you. Well, I'm sorry, Counselor. I was told to come here by Brother Scanlon, assembling 341 for business. I drink to your health and I'm better acquainted. Oh, it's like that, is it, Mr. Um... Murdoch? I'd have to look a bit closer into this, Mr. Murdoch. We don't take people on trust in these parts. There's a little talk in private. Yeah. Do you mind uh, stepping through that door there? any games on us. It'd be short script for you. Huh. A strange sort of welcome for a brother. Where were you initiated? Assembly 29, Chicago. What are you doing here? Looking for work. Why'd you leave Chicago? I'm telling you that. Why not? Because the rules say that one member can't tell another a lie. Oh, you mean the truth's too bad to tell, eh? Put it that way if you want to. Now listen here, mister. You can't expect me as boss to let into this assembly any for whose past I can't answer. Hey. You wouldn't squeal if I showed you something, would you? Well, wipe my hand across your face and talk to me like that. I'm sorry, I didn't mean it that way. Oh. Here. Take a look at that. Oh. Your work? Sure. Why did you shoot this guy, Pinto? Well, he threatened to squeal on me. So I croaked him and beat it out here. The thought of murder would be welcome out here, eh? Yeah, you've said it. You ought to go far. You look like being a pretty useful brother to us. Didn't flinch when I put the gun on you either. <laughs> you were the one in danger, boss. I got you covered from the first. And I guess my shot would have been as quick as yours. <laughs> you about this man? Yeah, you say it right now while I'm here. I'll say it how and when I please. I'm content to leave it to you to judge between us, Counselor. Well, what is it? Well, a young lady. 
I think she's free to choose for herself. Is she? But between members of the assembly, I should say she was. Well, that's your ruling, is it? Yes, it is. Were well, you thinking of disputing it? You back a newcomer against me, would you? Well, you're not both for life, Jack McGinney. And let me tell you this. When it comes to the Bolton... Ah! You've been asking for a long time, Bolton. Now you've got it. I've got nothing to kiss you, boss. All right. Now, we can't have bad blood between brothers. Go along in the bar, and I'll buy about the drink. friend of yours or any other cop. Well, Jack Murdoch of Chicago, all right, and don't deny it. I'm not denying it. Why should I be ashamed of my name? Well, you ought to be. What the devil do you mean? Ah, you can't pull that stuff with me. I'm Marvin of Chicago Central. We haven't forgot the shooting of Jonas Pinto. I never shot Pinto. Deny it's impartial evidence. As it happened, we couldn't get any case against you. So you're okay with me just as long as you're on the left. Get me? Good night. Well, boys, here's a new brother from Chicago. We'll just have drinks all around, and then we'll swear in well and truly into the assembly. We've got a special initiation here in Vermissa Valley, and you can't be one of us till you've been through it. That's okay with me. Okay. Brother Murdoch, can you bear pain? As much as anyone, I guess. Well done, brother. Now, one last word. You'll obey my rulings at all times. And the penalty for breach of faith is inevitable death. I understand. Well, boys, we must get to the business of the evening. There's a man in this town who needs trimming. And it's up to you to see that he gets it. I'm speaking of James Stanger, editor of the Herald. You seen how he's been panning us again in his dirty rags? Yeah. Why don't we bump him off? That might cause more trouble than we need to ask for. But I guess you can give him a pretty severe warning. Will you take care of that, Bowling? Sure thing. I'll take Van Schuss along with me. And you, Mansell? And uh, you, Gower? Okay. And, yeah. You'd better come along with us, Murdoch. We'll see the kind of stuff you're made of. That's okay with me. Come on, let's go.
He didn't hear this report. The bastard, he wasn't to be killed in me. Yeah, that's all. Lay off, Baldy. Counselor. I'm not much of a visitor, Murdoch, but I thought I'd touch upon your case. I'm honored. But how'd you know I was here? I only came this morning. It should be enough here that I do know. It may be enough for most men, but not for me. So you're a queer guy. Scanlon told me if you must know. Lives here too, so he says. Yeah. Have a drink. Sure. I thought you'd be getting into trouble, Cookie Murdoch of Chicago. He's a friend of mine, and I'll answer for his conduct. Well, what am I being accused of? Beating up old Stanger of the Herald last night. Not your fault, it isn't a murder charge. Say, I can bring a dozen men to prove he was playing poker with me. You'll not be able to hold him, Captain Marvin. I wouldn't bet on that. Take him away, boys. Any funny business, shoot him. <laughs> Do you find the prisoner, John Murdoch, guilty or not guilty? Not guilty. <laughs> You see, I told you you needn't worry. Mr. Holmes, I'd fallen desperately in love with Murdoch by this time. It broke my heart to find him going from bad to worse. But he was always straight with me. I see. And was Murdoch taken completely into the confidence of the scourer? Yes. In six months, his name was a byword in the valley. People were as scared of him as they were of McGinley. Pray proceed, Mrs. Douglas. One night, he and another man were sent to shoot one of the most respected pit managers in the valley. I felt something awful was going to happen. I didn't know just what. Tell the boys to scram. Okay, boy. Now then, Bowling, as soon as we get this going, you come back to these bushes and cover the door. Uh-huh. He's got to come out when he finds a place to light. And where are you going? Don't be a sap. I've got to cover the back, haven't I? Come on, let's go. Okay. Oh, I can't do that. It's secret. It's the business of the society. 
You know, when you come in, I thought you might have been a detective. Oh, Jack, can't you give it up? That's what I've come to ask you. I heard about last night. Oh, can't we get away from this terrible place, this valley of fear? No, I can't do that right now. They'd never let me get away knowing as much about them as I do. Do. Maybe in six months' time I could find a way. Six months? Is that a promise? Perhaps eight months. Anyway, within the year. Oh, darling. He's out hat there after his promise. Did he keep his promise? Did you leave in six months? It wasn't a matter of months, Mr. Holmes, but hours. That same afternoon, I was just going upstairs, and I heard someone come to the door. Jack. Trouble afoot. Police? Yeah. A Pilkerton detective. Yes, I don't mean anything to you, I know, but I'm too deep in this thing. I've got to get out. Tonight. And you want me to come with you? Yeah. I'm a strange sort of Romeo for a kid like you, but I'm on the level with you, I think. And we quit tonight? Sure. Is there any danger? Maybe we can stall the danger off. Maybe we can. Anyway, you be ready in case I come for you. I will, Jack. Yeah. I got some bad news. What sort of bad news? Well, I can't tell you in public, but let me collect a few of the boys and go into your room and discuss it. Okay, carry on. Only in corner, people. Go. Mantle, come into the boss's room, will you? Yeah, and you too, Willoughby. Okay, I've discovered something. Well, what is it? There's a fellow called Birdie Edwards among this. Well, he's a Pilkerton detective. And he's collecting evidence against us that'll send us all to the gallows. You sure are this? Yeah, you can take it from me, but I'll give you the details later. Anyone know this guy by sight? Sure, I do. But if we had quick, we've nothing to fear. We've got nothing to fear anyway. What can this man know about our affairs? Well, I hope you're right. But he's got the coal owner's millions at his back. Don't you suppose there may be some weak member among us who can be bought? Maybe he's got our secrets already. No, there's only one cure. That he never leaves the valley alive. <laughs> For the first time, Balding, you and I agree. Well, do you want me to handle this, boss? Sure, but you better tell us some more about it. Well, the other day I met a fellow who said he was a press man. And he offered me good money for inside stories of the scars. Although his face was familiar, somehow or other I couldn't place him. I know now that that was Bertie Edwards. I made a few inquiries and found out he was living at a place called Hobson's Patch. Under the name of Steve Wilson. Well, we'll just bump him off quick. No, I've got a better plan than that. Well, what is it? I'll go over to Hobson's Patch this afternoon and locate him. I'll tell him I'm a scholar, and I'll offer him the secret papers of the Society for a price. Only as I can't hand them to him in the street, he's got to come to my place to collect them. That'll fetch him. Well? Well, surely you can handle the rest yourself. Only once Mr. Birdie Edwards comes to my place, I don't think he'll leave it again alive, somehow. <laughs> oh. Well, he's coming. Good. Come right in, make yourself a home, boy. You think he knows much? Well, he's been here six weeks. He may have passed on quite a bit. But we'll make him tell us all about it. We'll have the truth out of Mr. Birdie Edwards if he has to cut his heart out to get it. Did you seem to send a trap? No, I got him on the weak point. Told him I'd show him all the papers of the scars. Well, if we handle it right, they'll never be able to prove a killing. Nobody will see him come up to the house after dark. And I'll lay odds, nobody will ever see him leave. Now, here's the plan. You boys all stay here, see? Bertie Edwards will be pretty heavily armed, so we've got to take him by surprise. He's going to knock three times. I'll go out, open the door, let him come in. I'll leave him in the outer hall, where I come in here and get some papers or something and, and give you the tip. I'll go back, and while he's reading the papers, I'll get the gun off him. Then I'll give a shout, and the sooner you come in, the better. You're the one to handle him. Not one word of warning does he get till Murdoch has his hand on his throat. Okay, 
Pity you haven't got shutters on your windows. Don't you worry. We won't be spied on. Perhaps he won't come. He's as eager to come as you are to see him. He may be here any minute. Now keep quiet. Not a movement till I give you the sign. so you can figure out what chance you've got. You dirty, stinking double crosser. There's something I'd like to say to you, fellas, before we part. Next time we meet, you'll all be in the dark. Well, I can put my cards on the table at last. I am Bertie Edwards of Bookerton. I played a pretty dangerous game in breaking up your gang. And no one knew I was playing it except Captain Marvin here and my employers. You think the game's all over, don't you, Mr. Clever Guy? Well, let me tell you this. You'll be hunted down whatever you go to. The scar will forget even if you go to China. Yeah. Well, I'll take a chance on that. You all fell for my supposed criminal record just as I thought you would. I've stopped as many crimes as possible. How many times have you fellas been to get your man and found he's gone to someplace else? Well, that was my doing. Yeah, and that was my doing too. Only I was just too late to save a man's life. But when I found the secret was coming out, well, I got to act quick. And so I'm able to hand over to Captain Marvin the worst gang of murderers this country has ever known. Handpicked by me. I told you when you joined us, the penalty for breach of trust is inevitable death. And you'll find that's true. Take him away, boys. Well, buddy, the boss will be pleased. You sure got results. Yeah, but I wouldn't go through all this again for all the money in the States. That's the whole story, Mr. Holmes. McGinty and a dozen hours went to the gallows. And Ted Balding, one of the very worst, got off with life imprisonment. Do you think this is Balding's work? Obvious. Obvious. I'm certain of it, too. We wandered around and finally settled in Switzerland. And then one day, my husband got a cable saying that Balding had broken jail and was believed to be in Europe. My husband must have got wind of something because we packed up in a few hours. And now... I see. McGinty proved himself to be right. Yes. Oh, Mr. Holmes, if you'll pardon me, I'll go and get some fresh air. This has all been terribly upsetting. Naturally, Mrs. Douglas. Well, that's all clear as crystal, Mr. Holmes. All we've got to do is to find Balding, and that shouldn't be difficult. Yeah, they may even have got him by now. Well, I'm going to slip over to the station for a few minutes. I suppose you won't be leaving just yet a while. Uh, no. Uh, with your permission, no, not yet. That's all right. I'm afraid you've lost your beehive, Mr. Holmes. Uh, nevertheless, you'll oblige me by taking care of that bowler hat of yours, Lister. Well, it didn't take us long to solve that. But I, I'm sorry for Mrs. Douglas. A strikingly pretty woman, don't you think? Now, you see, I, I didn't notice. Really, Holmes, there's something positively inhuman about you at times. <laughs> my dear Watson, I never allow my judgment to be biased by personal qualities. I can assure you that the most winning woman I ever knew was hanged for poisoning three little children for their insurance money. Oh, I see. Oh, Ames. Yes, sir. Is there anything I can do for you? Uh, you said your master used to do exercise. Uh, did he use dumbbells? Yes, sir. Uh, one or two? Two, of course. And you said he used them every morning. Uh, what about yesterday? Yes, sir. I remember him doing them. Uh, where? Down here? Yes, sir. He used to say he liked plenty of elbow room. Yes. Yes, thank you, Ames. Thank you. Will there be anything more, sir? No, 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 nothing more.
seriously, Holmes, this is all very simple. What's to prevent our going home to lunch? Only that I'm rather concerned about the missing dumbbell, what is it? Dumbbell? Yes. Yes, I am not referring to the good Lestrade, whom I'm aware has gone to the station, but to the equally solid article used for developing the muscles. And one usually looks for them in pairs, my dear Watt. I can only account for one. No, this is by no means a simple case. What complicates it still more is where does Moriarty come in? He doesn't. Baldy murdered Douglas, and it's Lestrade's job to find him. My dear Watcher, you appear to have forgotten that only this morning we decoded a message from one of Moriarty's men foretelling this tragedy. Oh, yes, of course. And so we did. But what's the next step, Holmes? You can lend me your umbrella. Umbrella? Yes. But it's not raining. Uh, how true, Watson, how true. Uh, nevertheless, I should like it. Uh, you brought the one with the crook handle, didn't you? Yes, I left it in the hall. But that's a wretched weapon, Holmes. Well, take my revolver. No, 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 my dear fellow. There's no danger. If there were, I'd ask for your help. No, no, I'm not uh, thinking of doing any shooting, uh, Watson. Just, uh, just a little fishing. Fishing? Yes. Yes, I, I want to see what the moat has to offer us. Oh, I see. Fishing. Thank you. Oh, by the way, where did Mrs. Dudgeon go when she left us? To the bottom of the garden. I saw her from the window. She was heading straight for the pergola. Ah, as I thought, Watson, she's probably talking things over with Barker. Now, look here, Watson. I want to be sure they don't come back to the house for a few minutes. Will you, like a good fellow, keep an eye on them and let me know if they make any sign of moving? Yes, certainly. I wanted to offer her a word of sympathy. straight during my examination. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, a bit not more than he can chew this time. Oh, you should have seen me as a broken-hearted widow. Do you pardon me, Mr. Holmes. I think I'll take some fresh air. This has been so terribly upsetting. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> Look out. Dr. Watson, would you mind coming and speaking to Mrs. Douglas? I was about to offer my condolences to Mrs. Douglas, but they appear to be superfluous. As a matter of fact, she wants to ask you something. Yes. I feel the gravity of the situation calls for some explanation. I'm afraid you must have thought my behavior very careless, Dr. Watson. Your behavior is not my business, Mrs. Douglas. But I must admit, I find it a little difficult to reconcile with the circumstances. What did you want to ask me? If I was to tell Mr. Holmes something in confidence, would he tell the police? I can't answer that. In other words, is Mr. Holmes working with the police or on his own? That I can't answer. Well, could he get rid of the police? Tell him he was satisfied and send him away? Certainly not. Mr. Holmes is an independent investigator. But I feel certain that he would withhold nothing from the officials that might help to bring the criminals to justice. If you require any further information, I refer you to Mr. Holmes.
I'm bound to admit, Holmes, I agree with you. This case isn't so simple after all. No, no, on the contrary, my dear Watson. To me, it becomes clearer every minute. But don't worry. I think I can put you on the right track. I should indeed be grateful. Now, the murderers... Oh, oh there's more than one. My dear Holmes, if you'll stop interrupting me, I'll explain my theory. Yes, Watson. I'm so sorry. I apologize. Oh, please don't mention it. So you have a theory. Well, it's more of a certainty than a theory. I would. I'm all attention. From the first, Barker's account of the tragedy didn't satisfy me. Uh, no, no, no. I noticed that. I came to the conclusion he was telling lies. Half-truths, Watson. Much more dangerous. He admitted that Douglas was jealous. And I suggest he had good cause to be. The guilty lovers wanted to get rid of the husband. So they killed him and used the story of the scourers to put everybody off the scent. I see everybody except the astute Dr. Watson. Well, it hadn't occurred to you, had it? Uh, no, no, I'm bound to say that that isn't my theory. But I'm going to prove it to you. When I went into the garden just now, the pathetic widow was consoling herself with Barker. They were laughing, positively laughing. That confirms it, doesn't it? Oh, yes, sir, well, that confirms it. And what's more, she wanted to ask you something in confidence. No, 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 Watson. No, no, I want none of their confidences. It's always awkward when it comes to an arrest. Then you agree with me. You think they're the murderers. Oh, dear Watson, there's an appalling directness about your questions at times. <clears throat> it's not so hard as you may think, Watson. You remember that I was puzzled about Douglas only using one dumbbell? Yes? Yes. I've found the missing one. Then everything's all right. And it's led to a discovery which has solved the whole problem. Solved? And we've been listening to a tissue of lies, Watson. The whole story of the tragedy as told by Barker is a lie. And as Mrs. Douglas supports it, she must be lying too. Now, Barker swears that when he entered the room, he found Douglas lying dead with this candle burning on the table. He also says that immediately, now mark it, Watson, immediately he rang for aid. He entered the room carrying that lamp and at once blew out this candle, all within the space of two minutes. Ames corroborates this. But he also says that the candle which Douglas brought down from his bedroom, this candle, was a new one. Out of the same packet as these. Well, what sort of a candle is it, Watson, that burned that amount in a few minutes? By Jove, Holmes, I believe you've got it. And moreover, if Barker's story were true, the assassin had less than a minute in which to remove two rings and replace one. Remember, the wedding ring was under the other one. Pin that card to the body, cross the room, and make good his escape. No, 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 Watson, it's false every word. Oh, that's a kindly thought, Ames. Oh, Ames, uh, can you remember what kind of shoes Mr. Barker was wearing when you found him in here after the tragedy? Yes, sir. Bedroom slippers. And a nice mess they were in. Uh, could you uh, conveniently lay your hands on one of those slippers? Yes, sir. Mr. Barker changed them in here for his shoes before he went for the police. Oh, well, would you bring them over here, Ames? Uh, Yes, yes. Uh, Here they are, sir. Thank you, thank you. You needn't wait. Ah. As I thought, it fits exactly. You mean Barker made that mark himself? It's part of this deliberate conspiracy, Watson, to hide the truth. Then why don't you arrest him? And Mrs. Douglas? <laughs> My dear Watson, if you asked the good list, I think he would. No, 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 Watson. These are only small figures in the drama. The principal player you will meet tonight. Where? Here? At through that door. See, in the ruined tower of Burston Castle. Oh, I see. Idea, 
Come out, Mr. Douglas. Douglas? Well, what on earth are you talking Mr. Holmes, I believe. Ah. Now, let me introduce Mr. Douglas of Bergston Castle, otherwise known as Birdie Edwards. But Douglas is dead. Oh, on the contrary, my dear Lestrade, as you see, he's very much alive. But I don't understand, Mr. Holmes. Who is dead, then? Will you explain to the inspector, or shall I? Well, you've done very well so far, Mr. Holmes. You go ahead. Well, Lestrade, uh, it is quite a simple case. It may be quite simple to you, Mr. Holmes, but how did you arrive at this solution? By means of a partially burnt out candle and a missing dumbbell. Now, the candle proved that Barker had been in the room with the dead man for at least 40 minutes before he gave the alarm. And I had to ask myself, what was happening during that time? What was Barker doing? Yes, I'm afraid that's the point I missed, Mr. Holmes. Ah, well, that's not the only point you've missed, <laughs> my dear Lestrade. Now, Mr. Douglas was being hounded by the Scarers, who'd sworn to kill him. So he retreated to this castle, where he took every precaution against intruders. But Baldy succeeded in entering during the day, unseen. That night, he attacked Mr. Douglas with a knife. It was knocked out of his hand. So he had to use the noisier weapon, the shotgun, which in the struggle went off killing Baldy and mutilating him beyond recognition. Oh, I see. Oh, well, that answers your question, Miss Jane. But what about Barker? Barker, my dear Watson, on hearing the shot, came down at once. And in order to put the scarers off the scent, they dressed Baldy in Douglas's clothes. The scarers mark on the arm completing the deception. Baldy's own clothes, Barker waited with a dumbbell and threw into the moat. Douglas then got dressed, took some food, and went into hiding. And that's what happened, Watson, while the candle was burning down. You see this bit? Am I right, Mr. Douglas? I can certainly hand it to you, Mr. Holmes. Yes. Yes, you came across one little difficulty, however. When you place that gold nugget ring on Balding's finger, you intended to place your wedding ring there also, eh? <laughs> but you, you couldn't get it off, could you? No. Though I've been in a country where wedding rings slip off pretty easily, mine wouldn't. <laughs> but how did you guess that Mr. Douglas was concealed here? It isn't a question of guessing, my dear Lestrade. The clue was supplied by that interesting little book on Burston Castle that uh, I, I once offered you. A clue which was amply confirmed by the equally interesting plan I found in the pocket of Balding's coat. Amazing, Holmes. No, no, simplicity itself, my dear Watson. Well, now that the case is complete, I suggest we go over to the house and discuss Mr. Douglas's position. No, no, you're too hasty, Lestrade. I haven't yet introduced you to the principal figure in this drama. The brains behind it all. Not your Professor Moriarty, surely. Moriarty? Well, who's he? My friend Dr. Watson will tell you later. Come, gentlemen, we must lose no time. Keep her running, Moran. I'll bring Balding back in five minutes. Look here, Mr. Holmes. You can't expect me to believe in this Moriarty theory of yours. Moriarty's no theory, Lestrade. But a very great fact. Oh, well, we owe you a good deal. I suppose I must humor you. Uh, uh. The catching of Moriarty will be the triumph of Sherlock Holmes. Quite apart from you losing your hat, Lestrade. Carry out your instructions, Professor. Oh, you're in this, are you, Holmes? Well, I warned you. <coughs> you're under arrest, Moriarty. On what charge? 
attempted murder of Mr. Douglas here. Our paths have crossed for the last time, Moriarty. Put the handcuffs on him, Lieutenant. It's a long drop. Yes. Yes, it's rather more than that required by law, I fancy, my dear Watson, but uh, equally effective. 